Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Smith, and it's my very great pleasure to be your guide to today's dialogue. I'd like to add my welcome to all of you here in Stockholm and also to all who are joining us online, our virtual audience. Thank you for being here. So the topic we're addressing is so vast that we cannot hope to cover it comprehensively, but what we, what we can hope to do is to make you think, and perhaps think a little differently about the topic by the end of the day. And we thought we would start by thinking about that word health. It means different things to all of us. And we asked our Instagram audience for the Nobel Prize what health means to them. And some of their answers are being displayed on the screen behind us. Now, we, the dialogue is a series of conversations, as the name implies. Some of those conversations are two people talking to each other, some of them are interviews, and some of them are panel discussions. And for our first session, we're going to have a panel of three people. They're going to consider this question of what health means to them. And they are Anna Beck, the Paralympian cyclist and chairman of the Swedish Paralympic Committee, Olga Tokarczuk, the 2018 Nobel Laureate in Literature, and, as already introduced by Astrid, Drew Weissman, 2023 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. Please join me in welcoming them to stage. <laughs> Anna, if you'd take the first seat. Yeah, thank you. I'll go in the middle. Yeah. In the middle? In the middle. <laughs> and Drew at the end. Oh, sorry, we've, okay. Swap round. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like a dinner party. It's oh. always like this. And I have to say, Anna, I'm not sure if people can see, but I think you already win the prize for having the best shoes in the Nobel <laughs> Week dialogue. Yeah, they're glimmering. <laughs> <laughs> so the WHO defines health as being a, to a, a state of physical, mental, and social well-being which is pretty all-encompassing, but some of the answers given by our Instagram audience were even more all-encompassing than that. How, what does health mean to you, Anna? To me, health means uh, to be able to eat good food, to have, uh, uh, have the ability to be physical, active, friends, family, to love and to be loved, and even though I have a disability, I still feel that I am healthy and well-being. So I have a neuromuscular uh, disease. That means that my muscles in my feet and hands, mostly, uh, they slowly dies. But that doesn't mean that I'm not healthy and well-being. So I, I think it's, it's very big and hard to explain, but my feeling of health is that I, I am healthy and well-being. Thank you very much indeed. Olga. Um, I don't know if you remember that the, the very simple definition of mental health was the Freudian one, and he said uh, that this is just the ability to work, laugh, and joy and it's very simple and i think it's uh, it still works but i would say that in our nowadays special situation we are living right now in the facing with uh, uh, just breaking down the entire climate situation and the planet uh, um, existence I think that there is a need to change this definition in the direction of uh, interchanging with uh, nature. So I would say that uh, nowadays mental health and health in general is a capacity to stay in a relationship with environment, with another beings, human beings and animal beings, and also with uh, 
um, things we created, so it's an ability to exchanging energy, I would say, perhaps a little bit poetic, I mean in giving and taking. This is the, the, the most important thing for me, giving and be able to also to take. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's very beautiful, and I love the way that the two of you have already gone from the personal, which is so important, to the global, which is equally important. So, thank you. Drew. So, my wife will joke I'm always the scientist, but I, I have a, really a modern Taoist approach to health, which starts with the universe, the solar system, the earth, all elements of the earth, the water, the air, the stone, the lava, everything that makes up Earth, and then everything else on Earth, the plants, all elements of animals. When any of that is out of balance, then health is disturbed. I mean, the, the classic example is the big asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. But there are many different ways that health and the environment and the world can be disturbed, and we see that nowadays with climate change, with political leanings. Uh, all of those affect health. You look at the birth rates, you look at the mortality among pregnant women, and it's very diverse, even across one country. All of that are signs that, that health in general is disturbed, and we need to look and see what we can do to try and correct that. Thank you. Anna, let me come back to you, because I know that you started personal, but you'd like to expand it a little, perhaps, in, the view, in view of the comments of the others which have taken us to the level of the whole planet. Yeah, it's very interesting to hear your views of uh, health and uh, I really believe that it's so wide and it goes from the universe to the individual. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do so you? I would, can Please. I add no, something? Of if yeah. you ask us about discussion. So Just. I would like to add <laughs> what you said that, <laughs> uh, uh, that there is a big difference for me in the way of thinking of people living in 20th century, philosophers, let's say, philosophers, that was a tendency to perceive the human being as an individual living in a, you know, nothingness around, in an absurdic world, disconnected from nature. And it changed very much recently because now we are becoming more and more aware that we cannot live without entire environment, um, the single human being cannot live without all those relations uh, he or she has. Uh, we cannot, our speaking is useless be, uh, without you, you listening to us. So this is this, this, this fundamental reaction. So now I think that uh, we, we change our thinking in a good direction. So this, uh, because in my, my opinion, always the thinking was, is on the beginning and then everything goes uh, following the thinking. You know what I mean? Yeah? <laughs> so uh, I'm happy that uh, what you said, Drew, is a very interesting and looking completely new perspective of thinking about ourselves in the world. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's exactly what should be happening at the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Ideas are flourishing. The, Anna, I wanted to ask you about the burden of health, because, of course, in some ways, good health, perfect health, is something that people aspire to. And that can, for some people, become a little bit of a, a burden. You know, I, I can't get there, so what does that mean for me? It's a bit like, in some ways, it's a bit like money, you know. People, some people are rich, and should everybody try to be rich? Should everybody aspire to be perfectly healthy? How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I, I, when I grew up, I was, I was loving sports, and I wanted to do sports, uh, but I, I often, I, I wasn't good in sports. When I ran, I was behind everyone else in the competitions, and I tripped and fell a lot, and so I became, I looked at myself as a bad athletic, yeah, because I wasn't good. 
But when I got my diagnosis, I understood why I had been bad in sports. And when I got into this <clears throat> paracycling world, it was like people just have one leg, they don't have arms, I have my disease, and, and they, they just moved on. They had their dreams, they, had, they achieved their goals, and they, they was like, it was a, a big perspective to, to see and feel that even when you have burdens, you still can become, you, you can do whatever you want anyway. <laughs> but you need to accept what you can't do and find other ways to get through it. And so, sir. Yes. I don't know if either of you want to come in on that, but uh, and society needs to accept it too. And in some ways, you know, I don't know, in, in Britain at the moment, for instance, there's a great deal of societal pressure on everybody to be fit for work, but not everybody can be fit for work. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. Mm. Yes. Sorry, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Good, we've solved that then. Okay, so I would like to turn to you all. Now, Everybody has their own view on what health means, and of course, all of your views are, would be lovely to hear too. Unfortunately, we can't, but perhaps the person next to you can. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to turn down our lights, turn up your lights, and to ask you to turn to the person next to you and spend two minutes talking about what health means, one minute each, if you like, and perhaps turn to the person you don't know on your side. Um, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. You can just use two minutes to check your phones. But <laughs> <laughs> you have two minutes. Please, and you can, it's a chance to say hello. It's, it's so very lovely to listen to you talk. I can't tell you how nice it is from the panel here to listen to you talk. And also, I am so lucky to have Anna next to me because she, as a, as a uh, time trial cyclist, is very used to looking at the clock. So she knew precisely <laughs> when the two minutes was going to be. <laughs> one, one thing we, we, we might touch on, perhaps, uh, Drew, is your um, deep interest in global health and how to uh, um, encourage health equity. So please. So th this is something I've worked on my entire career, but the Nobel Prize has given me a little boost to do it more. Uh, if you look at what happened during the pandemic, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America didn't receive RNA vaccines for over a year. Uh, Europe, United States, the rest of, of the wealthy parts of the world had them immediately. This lack of access to health care greatly diminishes the health of many populations. So we've been working for years trying to establish the RNA technology in low and middle income countries around the world. And why this is important, many countries have regional diseases, dengue, malaria, Zika, many others, that pharmaceutical companies don't have much interest in developing treatments for. You don't, they don't make money in low and middle income countries. So by building this technology from basic research through drug production, we give them the ability to make new therapies, treatments, vaccines for diseases that affect their populations. It also builds capacity. They'll now be building scientists to study these, to make the vaccines, to do the clinical trials. So it gives them access to technology, access to new medical treatments, the most advanced medical treatments, and access to better living. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much in Drew, uh, indeed, Drew. And that actually was the perfect segue into our next section of the meeting, which is on priorities for global health. And 
As well as being guide, my other role today is that I'm supposed to be timekeeper, and we have a lot to get through. And so I'm afraid we need to close this panel and move on to the next section. So thank you all very much indeed. You'll see all three of these people again soon. Thank you. Thank you.